on this occasion difference. So Xiao Tian started in 2000. No, down and I forgot again. 2014. Um, uh, but he actually started before 2014 as a master's uh, volunteer student. So, you know, he has been with me more than six years, nearly seven years, right? Um, together here. So he worked on uh, TMD growth and uh, a transfer uh, so that he made these, these uh, transfer process uh, to potentially eliminate any uh, post cross uh, or post uh, lithography process to uh, you know, reduce uh, you know, residues and so on. Okay? So um, he uh, finished his uh, proposal defense this summer. Right? Uh, summer. Yes. Okay. Someone else. Okay. Uh, February. Sorry. And then, um, so this is the right time. I'm, I, I wanted him to graduate, but he, he loves Steven so much he wanted to stay longer, but I just uh, <laughs> <laughs> persuaded him to finish. Okay. So, four years. So, hello everyone. Welcome to my dissertation defense. My name is Xiaotian Wang, and I'm from Professor Ye Xiang's lab. So today I'm going to talk about my research on a study of localized growth and the photoluminescence of transferred monolayer transition metal dichotomy lines. So at the beginning, let me introduce my committee members, uh, Dr. Li Xiang and uh, Dr. Xian Zhang from Mechanical Engineering Department, Dr. Yu Ping Huang from Physics Department, and uh, Dr. Tabaka Data from the NGIT. Uh, basic research objective of my PhD study contains uh, four parts. So first part, I'm going to synthesize the TMDs in location-specific format using CVD growth spacer. And uh, second, I'm going to develop a line transfer process for CVD grown TMDs and CVD grown TMD arrays. And third part, I'm going to study, uh, start, study the PMMA assisting wide transfer method. And the last part, I'm going to study the effect of this method on the photoluminescence intensity of transfer TMDs. A basic outline of today's dissertation defense. First, I'm going to about, talk about what is 2D material, what is, why we are doing research on 2D materials. Second part should be the computer specific growth synthesis PMP monolayers. Third part will be the aligned transfer of PMP monolayer and PMP monolayer arrays. The fourth part should be the study of solvent and polymer effects on the carrying density of the monolayer PMDs. And the last part, I'm going to give some recommendations for the further studies. So the development of electronics are really, really fast. In 2005 to 2014, the capacity of the micro SD card has increased 1,000 times. So what's inside these micro devices? A schematic diagram of the disassembled micro SD card shows us a memory core contains transistors. So one memory core contains billions of transistors. So one transistor will contain one byte of data. So in this case, in 1965, Moore came up with the Moore's law, predicted that the number of transistors on integrated surface doubles approximately two years. So however, as the development of the technology is so fast, so recently Intra has already released 10 nanometer technology, and AMD claimed that it released 7 nanometer technology. So even though this 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer doesn't stand for the size of transistor, but the size of transistor is already really, really small. So the small size of transistor leads to the problem of the 3D materials. The low dimension of the channel and the imperfection of the surface will lead to heavy electrical leakage. And this electrical leakage will generate a lot of heat. This heat is not one transistor, it's billions of transistors. So there's a lot, lot of money need to be put onto the cooling system of the current electrical devices, leading to a discussion that so the Morse law is still working or not. Is it still worse to keep reducing the size of the transistors and make things more and much more, more and more small? And the more and more and the more than that is um, right now everything needs to be flexible, needs to be biocompatible. However, the silicon-based field effect transistors the lack of flexibility because silicon is a solid 3D material. So is there any way to extend more slow? The answer is yes. So one of the most promising Solution is a 2D material. So 2D materials have limited vertical dimension and it, has three, it can be fabricated with flat surface free from defects. So in this case, the electrons are less prone to scattering. And also the 2D materials are flexible. 
So here is a, a field effect condenser based on all tooling material based, fabricated by the, some researchers from the University of California, Berkeley. And in this case, the silicon and silicon dioxide is just a supporting material. So it can be replaced by any other kind of materials. We talked about uh, tooling materials. So what are tooling materials? So in general, tooling materials are comprised of one layered one of our stories, including the graphene, phosphorin, HBN, and transition metal dichotronized, and all other kind of materials. So these 2D materials give us different energy gap, band gap, and they, they can be excited by different waves of laser. So in this case, it opens a broad opportunity for device applications. And also, the discovery of graphene shows how new physical properties, such as the thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, and the mechanical extension force, where bark crystal was done to the monolayers. So as the first demonstration of uh, isolation of graphene monolayer from 2004, you can see a great ranking of explore of this publication number on graphene. So till now, it's still around uh, uh, 35k per year of publications on graphene. So however, graphene is a gaseous semi-metal. So in that case, it limits its, its application for many uh, situations which requires a semiconductor materials. So people are moving their research focus, and they found that the transition metal dichotronized is a very promising candidate for this semiconductor area research. Transition metal dichotronized contains one layer of transition metal and two layers of trapped layers to form a sandwich structure. This material can be semiconductor, can be ferromagnetic, and can be superconducting due to different growth phases. And it has signal sensitive electrical and optical properties. Its band gap can be turned by applying the docking effect or the string effect. And uh, last but most, uh, similar to graphene, it's a flexible and transparent material. And it comes to the application part. When we fabricate the fuel effect transistors using this transition metal dichotronized, it shows very high on-off ratio, which is a very important property of the um, fuel effect transistor. Ever since 2010, since the first demonstration of uh, direct band gap of monolayer transition metal dichotronized. The publication per year for the monolayer uh, transition metal dichotronized and Van der Waals heterostructure has also greatly increased. So now it's over 1,000 publications per year on these topics. So TMD synthesis. How can we synthesize this material? So the most commonly used method is chemical ex mechanical exploration, just like graphene. The mechanical exploration of TMDs can give us a pro, um, mo, uh, probably most uh, high quality material. However, in by mechanical exploration, usually we get very small crystal size. So in that case, it might limit its application. So as more and more people are focusing research on this material, and the different synthesis methods have been developed, including the metal transformation, the chemical vapor transport and the temporal deposition including the MOCVD and LPCVD methods. So a brief introduction of the MOCVD groups of PMDs. Here is a schematic diagram of the MOCVD reactor and the MOCVD reaction chamber. We can see that all the critics were supplied by gas formats through the mass flow controller. So this means the MOCVD we can precisely control the amount of reactors and uh, we can control the speed and we can control the ratio between this amount of particles. So this will, is a very important character for the growth of TMDs, and such as the shape and the edge termination. MOCVD is one of the best measures since it is uniform vapor scale growth. So however, MOCVD has some, also has some disadvantages, such as it gives a relatively small green size compared to the low pressure chemical deposition. And the MOCVD, you can see the uh, gas, gas form particles are pretty toxic, and waste is much more to toxic, and uh, it uh, costs a lot of money to produce the waste. And uh, last, it's, uh, you can see all the growth are at random locations, so it's late of growth control to locations. So next uh, is the uh, MOCVD, which we are using currently now for the growth of TMDs. So here is the schematic of MOCVD. You can see that only carrier gases are supplied through the mass flow controller, and all the sources are located into the furnace, and the sources will be melted during the ranking of the temperature.
So every CVD grows usually gives two H type TMDs. This is semiconductor, and with some optimized growth result, the recipe and a very large simple crystal greens can be realized. The largest reported is around 500 micrometer for a single crystal. And every CVD gives a relatively short growth process because the most time consuming step is the ramping of degree. The typically growth temperature for the TMD is around 700 to 1000 degrees C. So in this case, the highest rate, ramping rate can reach about 70 degrees per minute, so the growth process is relatively short. So however, there are also potential problems for the LPCVD. The first is lack of control in the reaction sources compared with the MOCVD. So in this case, uh, the quality control, second, uh, the quality control will be extremely difficult. And uh, also, it has some lack of control in the growth location as reported in the literature. So I will extend these two parts, the lack of growth quality and the lack of control of the growth location here. So here is a basic schematic diagram I summarized through a couple of years of running LPCVD. That all of these factors have more or less effect on the growth results. There are some major type of factors, including the amount of the reactors, the gas flow rate, the sulfur magnet temperature, and the sample condition. Sample condition means sample size, substrate treatment, including cleaning and baking. So all these factors will do influence the growth results. So that's why I mentioned that the quality control is extremely difficult for the LPCVD. So even though the room temperature and the room humidity will influence the reaction quality. And uh, the second part challenge is the location control. You can see that uh, till 2017, majority of the publications reported the synthesis of TMDs are in random location. So uh, as well as our growth results. So why this is happening? A basic growth mechanism for LPCVD of MOS2. So at the first stage, the molybdenum trioxide and sulfur will become vapor phase due to the ramping up of the temperature. And the molybdenum trioxide will be partially reduced to molybdenum oxide sulfur molecular clusters. And then these clusters will condense into nanoparticles. We call this nanoparticles pores on the silicon dioxide substrate. And this is a major step why this material are synthesized on a random location. Because we cannot control the nanoparticles, where is the condensed point of these nanoparticle cores? And the last is the growth of the MOS2 will be from these nanoparticles, these cores. So that's a basic problem why the current or the previous reported uh, results are on the random location. So, what's the problem with the random located growth? The major problem is uh, we need to introduce a post dissolvable process. The post dissolvable introduces a polymer residue for the dissolvable process. And here is a basic test reported by the researchers. This is before cleaning, before a deep cleaning of the polymer residue and after a deep cleaning of the polymer residue. We can see the electrical properties of the devices are totally different. So that means if you grow TMDs on random location, so after post dissolvable happening, you have to do an AFM or whatever deep, deep clean to get back to the pristine um, electrical properties of these materials. So how can we solve this problem? So what if we can synthesize localize the TMD without post lithography You can directly synthesize the TMDs at a certain location with a certain size. So when you don't need to do the post lithography And also, it will bring us some potential applications such as we can directly transfer this single crystal arrays onto prefabricated network structure to do assembly. So I talked about transfer. So what is TMD transfer? Why do we need TMD transfer? TMD transfer basically means we take TMD out from the grown substrate and put it on a target substrate, such as a flexible substrate, transparent substrate. So these substrates cannot stand for the high temperature which requires for TMD growth. So in this case, we need to do the transfer. And also, sometimes we need to do assemble these TMDs with the prefabricated structures. So in this case, to fabricate these structures requires etching step. The etching step, TMDs cannot stand for the etching steps. And the last and most important, we need to fabricate heterostructures. Heterostructures bring us, opening us a new gate for more applications of devices. So even though there are some researchers that are trying to grow heterostructures directly from the CVD method or other method, 
However, it's all limited to two layers. Till now, there's still no reported on tri-layer growth of either TMD or TMD on other surface by, re by researchers. So in this case, if we do transfer, we can stack layer by layer and this. The transfer method for CFD growing TMDs, I divided it into two parts. So one part I, I concluded it as wet transfer, and uh, the second part is dry or semi-dry transfer. So the define of the wet and dry is based on the separation of TMD from the growing sub surface substrate. If there's some solution or the water was introduced, we call it wet transfer. If there's just a mechanical force, we use mechanical force as uh, exploit the TMD to peel them off from the target substrate, we call it semi-dry or dry transfer. So each of the transfer method has its own advantage and disadvantage. And the most commonly used method for the wet transfer is the PMA assisted wet transfer. In this method, we use KOH solution to strike the edge the sodium dioxide and separate the PMA layer from the target substrate with the TMDs. So why do we need, uh, why do we use the PMA assisted wet transfer for our TMD clones? Because first, it has no specific growth requirements. So like the previous mentioned surface energy assistant transfer, it uses a water penetration effect, the surface energy effect, which requires some pretreatment of the growth substrate, which might introduce the contaminations during the growth process. And you can see from the transfer result image, it's very high integrative transfer of TMDs. And the enlarged image shows the, the TMD edge is still remaining a very sharp edge. And um, next is the transparency of TMA. The transparency of the TMA will enable the aligned transfer process. We can precisely transfer the TMA on specific location and then with PMA with TMDs. However, this cannot be done through this metal assisted transfer because the metal layer is not transparent. And the uh, last two is it's relatively high efficiency. The transfer process can be done in like one or two hours, not like uh, we have to deposit metal for other transfer method. And it's relatively easy to handle. We don't need to use a very toxic material during the transfer process. So however, this pm transfer method was developed by the researchers. They directly copied it from the transfer of graphene. So to transfer graphene, they apply pm layer on graphene surface and using the copper etching or nickel etching to etch the bottom metal. And then the pm and the, the graphene will be transferred on the other substrates. So they directly copy that method to the transfer of TMDs. Is this method really give us a very clean transfer of TMD? There's a very lack of study on this area. So however, in our notice that every time after transfer, there is a very heavy PR density quenching after transfer. That means that this area needs a further study. So the second part I'm going to talk about is location-specific growth of TMD monolayers. As we know, the basic growth mechanism of CVD MOS2 so we cannot easily control the condense of the nanoparticle, the coarse position. So what if we directly pattern this molybdenum trioxide on the substrate and we load this substrate into the furnace and for growth? And all this molybdenum trioxide cores will be on this certain location. Then maybe we can get growth on these locations. So through a basic photodissolver process, I pattern this molybdenum trioxide and then after removing the polymers that perform the XPS test because molybdenum trioxide is relatively not that stable in the air. However, the XPS result still shows this remains molybdenum trioxide status. And then I directly load the sample into the furnace for the growth. So however, after growth, there's no MOS2 was grown on these areas and all the molybdenum trioxide was removed. So in, that, in this case, there are a couple of reasons. So first, it's very low surface energy of the silicon dioxide substrate. And uh, the reaction temperature is high. At high temperature, the molecules will be very active, and it will, they will be removed by the carrier gases. So how can we solve this problem? Thanks to Dr. Kang, which is a postdoctor in our lab, research lab, he developed a contact growth method. So for contact growth method, we use a patent source substrate to directly contact a growth substrate. It's still biosilicon dioxide substrate. By contacting these two substrates, we can successfully suppress the carrier gas flow. And in this case, we can also reduce the amount of precursors we deposited on the source substrate. So it's better for the monolayer growth. And this equation gives a better explanation of how this contact 
method works. So in this equation, the N stands for the concentration of the gas molecules, and the X is the distance between the source and growth substrate. The Q is the molecules from the source substrate, and the air and diffusion and diffusion time. So in this case, we can see as the distance of the source and growth substrate is decreasing, there's a very high concentration at these patent areas. In this case, this patent molecular dioxide will be restricted on this area for the further growth. So by applying this contact growth method with the patent source substrate, we will successfully um, realize the uh, array of MOS growth on the source substrate. And this growth can be extended to millimeter size, and with different size of the pattern of molecular dioxide, we can realize different size of MOS growth. And also, there's one thing I need to mention that we can also see some very thick growth all the axis you know, all the seed residue because we are patterning seed on the source substrate, and the pattern even is down to the five nanometer is still more than enough for monolayer growth. So leading to this growth residue or seed growth in the middle of the monolayer. <coughs> However, on the growth substrate, a uh, growth substrate is the bottom substrate contact with the, sur and the growth source substrate. At the initial stage, we were able to get very large single uh, polycrystal MOS to growth on the growth substrate. In this case, we patterned relatively large dots on the source substrate. And we can get the growth on the growth substrate with majority mon monolayer size. So however, there is some growth diffusion we can see. Growth diffusion means the growth on the unwanted area. And also these are all polypores for very large dots. So is there any way to reduce this growth diffusion and um, make this size of the dots small or make a single crystal? So with the optimization of the growth recipe, four major factors are mainly to be optimized. So first is the growth substrate surface energy. So KOH is a promising way to treat the increased surface energy of the growth substrate. And uh, the pattern, the size of the molecular dioxide need also to be developed. At um, the size including the thickness, the size of the doors, and the distance between two doors. And the sulfur and sulfur, small sulfur amount and sulfur melting point need to be carefully adjusted. And uh, the last is the ramping rate and maximum temperature. So through optimizing these factors, we were able to realize very well align the MOS to monolayer on predefined locations. And we can see um, from this area is major, still major like polycrystal, but it's majority monolayer with no growth diffusion. And with further some optimize of the growth quality, we can get more and more single crystal among these polycrystals. And for some area, we can even get fully single crystal monolayers. So this method is, we talked about all about the MOS2 growth. So is this a universal method for other TMDs like WS2, WSE2? The answer is yes. I've already realized the location-specific growth of WS2 on specific location. However, there are some potential problems for the growth of WS2 because uh, the WS2 currently can be only realized on the source substrate. There's no growth on the growth substrate. This is due to the synthesis temperature of WS2 is much higher than the MOS2, leading to a more active with the molecules that be removed by the carrier gases. A brief summary on the localized growth part. So a controlled growth of localized WS2 and MOS2 has been realized, and um, the correlation between the, thick, uh, the size, thickness, and spacing of the transition metal oxides has been investigated, and uh, the growth of the monolayer single crystal was accomplished on some area of the substrate. So next I'm going to talk about a line transfer. So here is the basic process of the PMML system wide transfer, a uh, modified PMML system wide transfer. So most of the research groups, they use spin-coated PMMA. However, in our case, we use directly applied PMMA by a dropper. In this case, we can get a relatively thick PMMA layer. And this PMMA layer will be very easy to handle for the further aligned transfer. And we will greatly reduce the separation time in the KOH solution of the PMMA and the TMD and the substrate. So after separation, the TMD, uh, the TMD, PMMA with TMD will be transferred onto the clean DI water for the conventional cleaning step. 
After cleaning the step, it will be scooped out with a target substrate. After baking to enhance the bonding between TMD and the substrate, there will be a, a polymer dissolved precise. So with the further development of transfer method, we will be able to realize the location-specific transfer process. So after cleaning this PMA layer with TMDs in the DI water, we will transfer it onto a thermal tip with a five micrometer square, a five millimeter square window, and uh, this uh, thermal tip will be attached to a glass slide to ensure that the PMA is flat, and uh, with the precise alignment of TMDs under the microscope and uh, the alignment of the microstructures under the microscope. And uh, we will contact the PMMA with the TMDs with the microstructure. So here is a basic demonstration of the location-specific TMD transfer. You can see a monolayer single crystal or MOS was precisely transferred onto this ring structure without any other TMD layers contact with the ring structures. So furthermore, for the next step, we are going to realize the transfer of MOS arrays on a patterned array microstructures. So in order to realize this, first, we ensure the total flatness of PMMA because for the localized, the localized transfer of just one single crystal, on that point, this flight is more than enough. But if we want to transfer a relatively large scale TMD monolayer arrays, we need to make sure that PMMA is totally flat. So with some modified uh, setup, I add, a PDMS, I add a PDMS layer between the PMA and the TMDs. So this PDMS DK layer will ensure that the PMA is totally flat. And uh, with the help of Graham Hander, um, which is a PhD candidate in our lab, we have 3D printed a uh, rotation stage added to the transfer station to make sure that we can rotate this bottom substrate to ensure the alignment. However, there's also a potential problem is the contrast of monolayer. By adding this PDMS layer, the contrast of monolayer is extremely poor under the optical microscope. So however, um, I'm going to talk about how to solve this problem later. So here is a basic transfer result for the location, uh, aligned transfer of MOS to arrays on, array, um, um, on pattern the gold and chromium arrays. So in this case, I use around the 15 micrometer diameter of pattern MOS to monolayer arrays. And to transfer it, this misalignment is was intentionally transferred to show the contrast is covered area and uncovered area of this dot arrays. So when it comes to couple hundred, this transfer method can be applied to couple hundred micrometer size. However, when it comes to couple hundred micrometer size, even if we align the middle area, the edge area will always be some misalignment. So this problem is. First, due to the lower contrast of monolayer under the microscope through this glass-like PLMS and PMA layer. And also, after growth, the TMD monolayers are not a circle shape. So it's extremely difficult to directly align the center of the circle shape with the center of these pre-patterned microstructures. That leads to a very slight angle difference from these two arrays. So maybe you align precisely on the area under the microscope, but either other area will have some potential problem of the misalignment. So to solve this problem with the help of Shichen, we tested a lot of methods to make markers on this growth substrate and the target substrate. So we tried like e-beam lithography and focused ion beam to deposit on PDMS layer, uh, focused ion beam to deposit on PMA layer, focused ion beam to deposit on growth substrate. And uh, this one gives the best result. We directly deposit the platinum through the focused ion beam on the target substrate with a certain distance from the TMD monolayers. And uh, this image shows the TMD monolayers transferred onto the glass slide with PDMS and PMMA. We can see the monolayer area of TMD is very, very hard to see, but the marker is still able clearly to see. So by aligning these markers on the bottom substrate and the PMMA substrate, we can precisely transfer and realize a better transfer result. Can you turn off the chrome for one second? No. Okay. Where, where is the monolayer again? Uh, the monolayer is here. It's a similar size here. Because it's very low contrast, so you cannot see it almost. But it's there. And there's one monolayer here. 
So next step, I'm going to talk about the study of solvent and polymer effects on the photoluminescence intensity of TMDs. So in order to study that, first we need to understand the basic mechanism to use for transfer TMDs using this transfer method, which is very late of study by researchers. So most of the researchers they believe that oh we put the uh, TMDs on silicon dioxide substrate with PMA cover and into the KOH solution and KOH will ash the silicon dioxide and then the separation of the surface and the PMA will happen. However, this is not correct because the KOH ashing speed is very low on silicon dioxide substrate on the at room temperature. However, in our transfer case, the separation of PMA layer and the substrate will always be done in five minutes or 10 minutes. So it's not able for the KOH to directly fully ash the silicon dioxide layer. So in this case, with some detailed study, we came up with this transfer mechanism. So this is a combination of KOH etching process and the water penetration process, like the surface energy assistance transfer. So at the beginning stage of the transfer, the KOH will slightly etching the edge of the silicon dioxide substrate. So in that case, the water has some tendency to penetrate between the substrate and the polymer and TMDs. This is due to the surface hydrophilicity difference between the substrate. Silicon dioxide is uh, hydrophilic and the PMMA with TMDs are hydrophobic surface. And due to this uh, surface energy effect, so the PMA layer will be separated from the KOH. So however, uh, a constantly PL quenching will be seen uh, after the transfer of TMDs. So this is a very basic transfer result. We can see the after transfer, the PL intensity has decreased to about uh, tw one twentieth of the original PL intensity. So why this is happening? It's worth it to find out. To find out this problem, first we need to confirm that our transfer method has no problem. So we are using a thick PMMA. So thick PMMA will bring, may bring a different force to the supporting layer. As a supporting layer, it may apply the strain and stress effect to the TMDs. So in this, we mimic the other growth transfer method to use thin PMMA transfer. However, this PL function is still existing. And also some researchers reported that the silicon dioxide is a hydrophilic surface and it has tendency to trap water during the transfer process. Also, it will trap water from the air. So in that case, uh, we, we used a PDMI substrate with a hydrophobic substrate surface to fully get, uh, to maximally get the, get avoid of this water effect. And uh, however, we can see that indeed the PR intensity is increasing a little bit, but however, it's, uh, there's strong still, uh, PR quenching is still appears. So that means there is something happening during the transfer process. In order to test what is happening during the transfer process, we perform a series of testing requests. So some research, uh, researchers reported that the solvent and polymers such as the acetone, IPA, will be like electron donator or electron attractors for the TMD. Such will be. So we performed a sequence test of these solvents and polymers on the transfer process. So each of the solvents was applied on the TMD surface and then it will be washed with DI water and baked on a hot plate to mimic the transfer process. We can see there's very tiny difference between all these polymers and solvents including the PMMA and the IPA DI water and the acetone applied on the surface. There's almost no change after cleaning step. So that means we have one last solution is KOH solution. And also Many research groups they use different concentration of KOH solution for the transfer. So is there any difference between this concentration of KOH? So I performed the several transfer using different concentration of KOH. So even though there is a slight difference between each concentration of KOH, however, the overall tendency is still strong quenching. So in this case, we need to test the KOH effect alone on the TMDs. To test this, we cannot directly apply KOH solution on the TMDs grown on silicon dioxide substrate. Because as I mentioned, due to the surface energy effect, the KOH, uh, the TMDs will be removed, easily removed by the KOH solution. So in this case, we need to find the other substrate which has a very strong bonding with the TMDs and it also can resist KOH. And most important, it should be a hydrophobic to eliminate the, the surface energy effect. So we choose PDMS as a uh, ideal substrate 
And um, also, we need to uh, find a transfer method that doesn't involve any KOH during transfer method to transfer that grown TMDs on the PDMS substrate. And then we can soak the PDMS substrate with the TMDs into the KOH solution to test the KOH effect. So here is a basic copper transfer method reported by a group in 2015. And then in this case, the deposit using the PVD or the thermal evaporator to deposit uh, a single layer of copper. And they use thermal tape attached to the copper. By directly pulling off the thermal tape, the, thermal, the copper will be stay with the thermal tape. And the copper is providing a very strong bonding with TMD monolayers. And they will transfer this copper with uh, uh, TMDs on the target substrate and um, remove the, the thermal tape by beating and first using some copper agent to remove the copper. So by using the copper method, we successfully transfer the TMD monolayers onto the PDMS substrate. And after transfer, we perform the PR mapping. Uh, it's shown in this right line. The PR still shows a relatively high intensity. And uh, after, that, after that, we soak our sample into the KOH solution. And we used the 30% KOH solution for two minutes. And then we performed a conventional cleaning step for the PMA system transfer. We soak and rising with DI water for five times, and each time for 10 minutes. And we bake the substrate on the hot plate for 100, uh, 130 degrees C for another 10 minutes. And we performed the PR mapping again. So here is a representative data from the PR mapping result shows the PR is doing, is, um, having a heavy quenching after KOH treatment, even after cleaning step. So that means KOH residue is really doing something. So a further um, test uh, by time-dependent KOH treatment can have a better explanation of what is happening in these materials. So the red line stands for the traditional, uh, not traditional, but for the pristine WS2 transfer on PDMS substrate mapping. And after 10 seconds of KOH treatment and the cleaning step, we can see a slightly quenching, uh, quenching of the PR intensity. However, this data doesn't give us anything because there might be some other reasons like the focus problem. When we apply, when we increase the treatment time to another um, 50 seconds to reach a total of 60 seconds, we can see a greatly quenching of the axon peak and the increasing of the triumph peak. So in this case, it can be explained that the TMD surface has tendency to attract the positive ion, and um, the QH is a very active electrical dona electron donator. So the increasing of the carrier density in the TMD monolayers will enable the transformation of the axon to the trial. And with further longer treatment time, you can see the overall tendency of the PR density is quenching heavily. So in this case, when the carrier density in these materials are keep increasing, the non radiative recombination will become dominant, leading to the overall quenching of the PR density. So a further mapping of the Raman peak shows that uh, the, there's no strain effect during the treatment of KOH solution. And also further XPS data analysis shows that uh, there's always a constant potassium um, peak showing even after several times the water cleaning. So right now, we have located that KOH is a major reason. So it's KOH, and we have given us some predict that KOH might be an electrical donator. So however, we need to um, avoid the effect that the KOH is etching the crystal of this material. So in order to, carry, to solve that problem, I designed an annealing test. This annealing test requires four times of PR mapping. And uh, at the initial stage, the WS2 on the PDMS was mapped after the first annealing. And after KOA treatment, we can see the, the blue curve, the PR intensity was greatly decreased. And uh, we performed uh, a an vacuum annealing again in the furnace, and we can see the PR intensity is almost recovering to the original intensity. So that means this is a recoverable process. And by, by further treatment, with longer treatment time, we can see the PR intensity is greatly decreased. Um, uh, so this means that this process is a repeatable process, and the annealing will greatly help to recover the PR intensity of the defect. So the annealing is a relatively complicated process. Is there any like easier process to do the recover to help to recover the PR intensity? So we know that uh, 
QH is alkaline. So what if we directly soak it into acid during the transport process? Is it able to help to recover by neutralize the QH by the acid? So another uh, design experiment was performed by using the acetic acid treatment of the QH molecules. Um, you can see that uh, the, uh, after the acid treatment, indeed the PRM density is recovering. However, after the second treatment, I can see that there is some damage of the crystal even under the micro optical microscope. That means acetic acid is not a suitable acid for the neutralization treatment, even though it will bring the PRM density back a little bit. So that probably other treatment with acid that's suitable for this position that requires further study on. So all I talked about before was about the test. The test means we transfer the TMDs on a PDMS substrate and we directly apply on the KOA as a KOH or PMA acetone on the surface of the TMDs and then we perform the PR measurement. So however, when it comes to the real case, we are needing help to recover the PRM density. So an anneal test after transfer onto the silicon dioxide substrate and after anneating shows the PRM density indeed increased a little bit, but compared with the original PRM density, it's still very heavy quenching. So why this is happening? We made some uh, detailed study on this area. And uh, in our case, the testing case, the PDMS substrate and the TMDs was the, the, the surface of TMDs was exposed directly to the solution. So even on some absorptive TOH residues on the surface of TMDs, it will be removed by the annealing effect. So however, for the real transport process, the contact of the TOH and the surface of the, uh, the TMDs is on the bottom. And uh, after, tra tra after transfer, this bottom power TOH will be trapped on bottom. So in that case, annealing effect will not work for the real transfer case. So is there a potential way to solve this problem? So with the help of Sui is also a PhD candidate in our lab, we have, decided, uh, we have designed an intermediate transfer process. So in this intermediate transfer process, we combine the, P, uh, the PMA system wide transfer with a traditional stamping transfer method. So after the TMDs with PMA are detached in KOH, the PMA layer will be transferred on a PDMS layer first. And the PDMS layer, uh, the PMA will be ashed using the acetone and IPA. And next step, the PDMS layer with TMDs will be transferred onto the tablet substrate by a stamping transfer method. And uh, after peeling off the PDMS layer, this TMD layer will be flipped up because these um, trapped molecules will be exposed to air. And after that, we will perform a vacuum annealing, which will further remove these trapped molecules. So a brief summary of the transfer part. Uh, a light transfer was realized to transfer the grown TMDs and TMD arrays on specific locations. And I performed a detailed study on the solvent <coughs> and polymer effect. And we investigated the, the reason for the PR quenching, <coughs> and we provided a potential solution for the PR recovery. So a brief mention about the technology contribute to this field. I have realized a deterministic TMD synthesis which with this controllable size and location, and I have performed the first detailed study on TMD system wide transfer towards achieving a clean transfer TMD. So some recommendations for future studies. So next step, this project will be going on the deterministic transfer of TMD monolayer arrays on microstructures, and these arrays might not be this pattern arrays, might be arrays on different locations with different size. So in this case, one major problem we need to solve is the missing flake. As also mentioned in previous slides, in the full monolayer single crystal growth, there's always missing flakes for our, uh, for our like, um, localized growth. So this is because our treatment method for the increasing of the surface energy so we are using KOH treatment to increase the surface energy, which might not provide a very even treatment of the each point of energies. So the missing flake probably gives lower energy area, so it will not, not attract another particle pores leading to the missing growth of these materials. And the next is the optimization of the transfer method. So even though that uh, we can perform a uh, intermediate PDMS transfer to further remove the KOH effect. This is very complicated. It requires several annealing processes. 
So recently it's reported that the PVA might be a very promising polymer for the transfer of TMDs. And uh, PVA can be dissolved in water solution and uh, it can perform a very strong bonding with TMDs and uh, we can directly peel it off through the mechanical exploration for matter. So that's the end of my dissertation. And uh, here are some publication patents and the conference presentations. So I want to first thank the committee members for coming to my dissertation events and thank for the great opportunities they provided for the collaboration projects. And I also want to thank Professor Yang. He's a really patient advisor and uh, he is, has a very passion I had a question on the researches. Whenever you email him, he will reply, reply you, no matter on the weekends or during the night. And I also want to thank Dr. Kang, he's a postdoctor in our research lab, who is leading our research direction. Also want to thank Shichen, Suwei, which greatly helped, and some graduated students, which greatly helped on my research. And also collaborated students in Professor Huang's lab, who provided our samples for the free transfer test. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, question, comments from the audience? Please? See you So, uh, during the PMA, uh, the anion, the vacuum anion. Uh -huh. so, so, if you do like three cycle, over three cycle, the we, the recover, the PL still recover. I saw there are only two yeah, cycles. Yeah, there's uh, only two cycles here. Actually, the PR, after the second treatment, the PR analysis is still punching, that means it's a repeatable process. So after it, uh, it's, um, it's supposed to recover after certain year also. I, uh, also, I haven't tested that yet. Uh, this is a change of QOH concentration. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this transfer is a direct transfer of TMDs on the copy substrate by using the PMA system wet transfer method. Mm -hmm. However, during this transfer process, there's one step that we need to soak our PMA uh, uh, sample in the QOH solution to lead to the separation of the bottom substrate with the PMA layer. And in that case, the QOH concentration might be a problem here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use a different concentration of KOH to test uh, if there's any difference on the transfer results, the PR intensity. However, all the, no matter what kind of TOS concentration, it doesn't influence much. The overall tendency is to heavily quenching. So later you choose 30%? Yeah, later we choose 30% with a very commonly used QOH concentration for the mm -hmm. uh, PR versus Y transfer. Okay, other questions? Shichen? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's very quiet room. Uh, so this is a excellent talk. Uh, you're too nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, committee members, please. Well, I'm also trying to learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your thesis, like if the temperature is high, it gives large size of crystal if the load is more than boundary of small crystal. Why is that? Oh, you mean gross mechanism? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned in your that it says that if the temperature is low, then you get like a, a small crystal size, more than boundary. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, here. 
So the all the fact you, you mentioned about the factors that influence food quality. Yeah. Now indeed, that um, at a relatively high temperature, we can get um, uh, a more more growth density because uh, there's a more condensed cores, and these cores will be grown larger with high temperature. So that means. Uh, if we use a relatively high temperature to grow these TMDs, it will give us some larger size. Yeah. However, we use some relatively lower. Uh, however, if you grow this too high temperature, the quality of the TMDs will also decrease because the high temperature is doing some effect to the TMD quality. We use some relatively low temperature to grow, even though the density is a little bit low, but the quality is relatively high for the low temperature growth. So right now, people are researching on the extremely low temperature growth. I attended a meeting that they, they, they reported that they can grow TMDs around 400 degrees. So in that case, they claim that they can directly grow in TMDs on the flexible substrate and transparent substrate, because that polymers, some thermal resistant polymer can stand for that. So that's a very promising growth measure for low temperature uh, TMD growth. So that's Yours is 1,000 degrees. Uh, we are around uh, 7, 750 degrees. Uh, following, following up on that question, so that uh, example, that is the first time I hear it. <laughs> so you grow uh, TMDs at 400 degrees C on the flexible, that, so that flexible substrate is supposed to be polymer? Yes. Polymers are hydrophobic, and how come this condensation and you can uh, Not all the polymers are hydrophobic. There are some polymers are hydrophilic polymers. Well, like what? Uh, I, I actually, I don't know about their research. So, I just a tangent. So, those are, those, so there are, there are those uh, super polymers that are uh, yeah, actually highly that thermally polymer... resistant and hydrophilic, huh? Wow. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And they're probably they're doing some treatment. Like you, they're usually you should probably try that uh, probably before you graduate, right. maybe. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I have a question mm -hmm. for the last slide. Last slide. Uh, so that about the possible solution for the paper. Oh, okay. Uh, just. Uh, oh yeah, here. Mm -hmm. So so you have uh, the PMA layer on top. And yes, so after you transfer that on the PDMS, do you use acetone or annealing to remove that? We use acetone. The PDMS we use we resist acetone. Okay. Yeah, PDMS will not be removed by acetone. Okay, sure. So so that's very good. Okay. And and, and also uh, a general question is uh, how how do you see the future applications out of this uh, large scale growth and transfer method? Well, the future applications, including many things, and uh, the most promising mm, is the integrated optoelectrical integrated circuits. So, optoelectronic circuits it requires um, different TMDs on different position, and we can grow different TMD arrays on different position, and we can perform a line transfer in one transfer process to fully transfer the TMDs on these integrated circuits, because. Um, like I mentioned, if you like fabricated several microstructures on different position, if you perform a conventional transfer, you need to transfer one by one. So which is not practical if you introduce a lot of contaminations. However, for the location specific growth, we can directly grow the TMDs on specific location. And for the location specific transfer, we can directly transfer it in one transfer step. We will minimize the contaminations during transfer and growth. So how strong is, uh, what's the strongest uh, ferromagnetic effect that the people have found in such TMD materials? Oh, you actually I'm not researching on the ferromagnetic things because uh, it's another student's work in our lab. So I'm not that sure about the ferromagnetic effects of TMDs. Okay. Uh, the, the seventh word question is that uh, I think uh, yeah, uh, the contact growth approach uh -huh. is, is, uh, is uh, very, very interesting and uh, your um, entire PhD work is tied to that. And, uh, and so I, my 
question is that, that uh, it looks like uh, you guys have achieved the, uh, the, the grid size is about a tenth of uh, microns. Yes, right? exactly. So the first question is that is it possible to extend that to larger sizes? And uh, the, se the second question is that you mentioned that, that uh, you have been able to do this over a physical uh, area of uh, several millimeter, right? So, so is it possible to extend that to about the, the wafer size or half or a quarter of wafer to? Mm, actually, the answer is yes. And um, for the size of the monolayer crystals, you can control by controlling the size of the molybdenum hydroxide spot pattern. So in this case, probably we'll get a polycrystal. And you mentioned about the green size. So green size is really difficult to control. So right now we can use tens of micrometer size of the single crystal. This means the green size is micrometer uh, around uh, tens of micrometers. And uh, by further increase, uh, increasing the um, size of the molybdenum five dots, dot, uh, molybdenum five side dots, might just bring us some polycrystal. Because uh, this contact method, if we pat directly pattern the molybdenum five side, the condensation of the cores will be all around these patterns. So in that case, there will be multiple cores, and uh, will lead to the multiple growth, so that we not grow the single crystal at very large size. Yeah, and uh, the second is uh, weaver scale growth. That's also what I want to mention. That uh, after our work, our work was published in 2017, and after our work, there are also some multiple papers reported about the location specific growth. So one of the most promising methods they are using the metal dots as the promoters. So they claim that the TMDs has a tendency to grow around these metal dots, and then in this. By using this method, they directly pattern the gold doors or the platinum doors and the performing the CVD growth. And the TMDs will be grown around this metal door. Also, it's a polycrystal TMDs. However, their growth method can be extended to almost to weaver scale, very large scale. So that's a promising way to try. What's the size of the, um, the, the doors? They can, they can manipulate it uh, this nanometer size, around the 500 nanometer doors. Dots. And afterwards, they remove the dots. Uh, actually, that's a good question. That they didn't remove the doors because the doors is extremely hard to remove, yeah. and the doors will be attacked contact with the with the TMDs. And even after transfer, the doors will still on the on the TMDs because the gold the platinum is very poor location with the sitting duct substrate, and after transfer, the doors was always there. So that means there are some metal contamination of the some area of their growth. So that requires a further study to remove the doors. Right. So in that sense, so the current approach potentially better than their approach. Yes. Because uh, you remove everything and then. Uh, yeah, we can remove everything and uh, realize the fully monolayer growth and transfer. Okay. So if our focus is not on to um, the uh, single crystalline mm -hmm. monolayer. So if we we don't quite care about uh, the crystallinity of okay. it, right? Mm -hmm. So would it be possible that yes. to make this uh, grow over? Yes, it will be possible. So definitely, with size, but uh, you can still. Uh, yeah, the result of, yeah. Make sure that it is a monolayer, not a not a multilayer. Mm -hmm. So there are two things, right? Mm -hmm. One is the single crystal or multi crystal. Yes. The second is how many layers. So what you mean is a pure monolayer or the monolayer like this? Some with very few double bi layers, fine. Or you want like fully monolayer like this, this goes. Like 90% uh, is? So 90% is monolayer that's able to realize. Just like in this figure, 
So the majority of area is monolayer with only a very few bilayer in the middle of the substrate. So in this case, this skill can reach almost a half wafer skill, half chip skill. I see. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, I do have uh, another question. So, uh, so you pointed out very clearly uh, the pros and the cons of this uh, web transfer and mm -hmm. the dry yeah. transfer, right? Yes. And, uh, but uh, because of the KOH contamination, actually you had to uh, use annealing twice in order to yes, exactly. get rid of the IM both on the top and at the bottom. Yes. So, so now if you take all those into consideration, so which has more practical relevance whether it is the approach that you are developing now or the joy transfer joy standing approach mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there yes it it doesn't <coughs> weakness for that at least yeah, you yeah, yeah i to. understand your question it's very very nice question and uh, Currently, the major problem, problem for the dry stacking transfer is the integrity of the TMD transfer. Because we are using the me pure mechanical force to peel the TMDs off from the growth substrate. So in this case, the dry transfer usually gives very low integrity of transfer TMDs. So however, by using this metal assistant transfer, it's uh, kind of different because metal is really providing a very strong bonding with the TMDs. So the dry transfer Mm, intentionally, it's not that great for high integrated transfer. And even though there are some researchers who still are working on this dry transfer, or they combine the dry transfer with partially wet transfer without KOH effect. Because mm -hmm. that will be a promising way. Like uh, we found some, like I mentioned in the recommendation study, we used like um, a PVA polymer. That polymer, after baking, will provide a very, very strong bonding with TMDs. So that very strong bonding is much stronger than TMDs and the silicon dioxide such bonding. So we peel that PVA off, the TMDs will be left on the PVA substrate. And in that case, there's no KOH like introduced during transport exercise, and we can remove, KOH, remove the PVA by the DI water. So that's probably more promising way. So however, like uh, it also depends on this um, applications of the transfer. Well, sometimes we need to test the uh, TM and uh, what kind of T cross section TM image, and we directly transfer it onto the TM grid. So TM grid is a suspended grid. So just one time annealing, all the QH impact will be removed. So it also depends on the different transfer situation, application situation. So we can choose different transfer methods. Following up on that question, the integer you mentioned integrity of the transfer on the dry transfer there. Um, so suppose that we don't have a, a, a requirement for alignment here, then the second method over there, the, or the third method, metal assisted half dry transfer over there, those can provide wafer scale transfer without any damage or any doping there, right? Yes. And, uh, but also you need to mention that first, uh, they will introduce um, like a metal remover, like a, a potassium hydroxide, uh, and uh, some other thing to further remove this metal layer. However, this is wrong, so it's QH. Oh, sorry, <laughs> not for that. It's um, uh, ammonia uh, sulfide. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That kind of metal agent will also cause, probably will also cause a doping effect. Mm -hmm. So you still need some further test and uh, the removal step. Okay, all these good, good. So for further clarification, can you please tell, tell us why the PDMS dry transfer cannot be used for your case? Oh, so PDMS dry transfer, unlike the conventional like uh, transfer to transfer the mechanical exploit TMD, this PDMS is just to use as a sticker stamp. So you use it like as a tape. They directly put PDMS on the growing substrate and using the stick, because PDMS has a relatively sticky surface. 
Uh, yeah, they are using a sticky bonding to bond the TMD on the PDMA circuit and then peel off from the growth circuit. So this will uh, highly depend on the bonding between the TMDs and the growth circuit because the bonding is very strong. Mm -hmm. The integrity will be very poor because a lot of TMDs will be left, will be broken during the spinning off process. So in this case, uh, the pure PDMS transfer is not suitable for the transfer of TMDs, this high integration. Any other question? Uh, I have a few questions here. Um, six. Not really. 47. So here you are suggesting, you're suggesting a possible solution here. However, you haven't tested this one, right? Yes, we haven't tested So my question is, uh, how practical is this in making video devices, right? You, you want to make devices, mm -hmm. FATs, and or some sensors, for example, and how practical is this method? Mm -hmm. Where those devices and then the PMDs, where these PMDs have, have to be uh, contamination free? Yes. Actually, so, this, this process is um, pretty good, actually. Actually, we... And it, we try first we transfer it onto a PDMS layer, and uh, we will use the PDMS layer as a stamping transfer method. Uh, this, this PDMS layer can be directly applied to the line transfer, so we don't need to add the PDMS. That has not been reported elsewhere, or is it just... Uh, actually, it's a combination of one method and another method, we combine it together. Nobody has combined it, and but we cannot see it's totally new. Yeah, it's a combination of red transfer, it's just uh, added the intermediate transfer process. Okay. Um, 51. So, can you explain more about the PBA? And uh, is this something that we should use in the future? Or can you, can you elaborate a little bit? Oh, actually this method, uh, they are testing on their sample also. And you can see that their sample is polypristal groups of MOS4, almost a fully covered the substrate. So in that case, the bonding between the MOS2 and substrate is relatively lower than ours, because ours growth is um, like some single crystal growth, and the single crystal, the edge of single crystal is really performing a very strong bonding system. I, I lost, so that, that's uh, bonding is low? On the, on the yeah, if you come why? to the polycrystal, it's always having a lower bonding than a single crystal because the edge of the single crystal is, during the growth step, it will form a very strong bonding with the substrate, than the polycrystal. Because polycrystal, there's um, green boundaries, connected green boundaries. However, when the green boundary is exposed to the air after formation, this green boundary is providing very strong bonding with the substrate. So this is also- well, In that case, polycrystal will, be, uh, will have to be stronger because you have lots of green boundaries there. Oh, this, that's uh, the green boundary is connected to other green boundaries. It will not create a very strong damping bond with the substrate. However, you have it to is prove? you're just saying it, or yeah, I'm just saying it. I haven't proved it. But um, there's a previous paper mentioned that um, if you want to enable that transfer, you need to like use um, some knife or whatever blade to scratch it, scratch the edge to get avoid of the edge effect because there's always an edge effect for the single crystal that will provide a very strong bonding between these TMDs and the substrate. So in their case, they, they are using the polycrystal wafer scale TMD monolayers and uh, they fabricate these PVA stickers and uh, they, they, they apply the stickers on the surface of the MOS2 and they generate a relatively high temperature heating and they will melt this PVA a little bit. So melted PVA will provide very strong bonding with the MOS2. And by peeling it off, like a mechanical peel of dry transfer method, they will peel the MOS2 off. So this method, if it works on our sample, it's a worse fire method for the future reaction. Um, so you were suggested possible solution thing that mm -hmm. the just method and this method, which will be uh, more suitable to apply to uh, the transfer onto wave circuits. 
and uh, you tried this uh, transfer, and then so far it didn't work, right? We didn't find the nonlinear effect, so maybe due to wasn't wasn't due to contamination, right? Yeah, we don't quite yeah don't quite know yeah. But the, but the, okay, just to follow up what you said, I saw the I saw the how strong the bonding force is has to do with um, the detailed lattice structure of the substrate surface. If you just intuitively picture, right? So if the lattice constant match, right? You would uh, think that you you actually could have stronger oh, okay. when you have uh, uh, super crystal. I see. Because then all the walls will be along the same. I see. Okay. Right? So they could enhance each other, but at the other case. But uh, now, if you your subject is uh, silicon dioxide, right, mm -hmm. which is, is essentially pretty pretty amorphous, so it is really hard to see. I think uh, it, is a, it is a good idea maybe that you guys could look into even that uh, if you can create uh, such uh, a significant uh, difference in the bonding for the single and the, and, the, and the multiple crystals, so that you actually will be able to Say just to transfer the single, or just to transfer the multi crystal, and uh, to have some nice applications. Mm -hmm. oh, Great, thank you for your suggestion. Okay, uh, audience, please excuse uh, committee members. Please. Hi. Keep it.